Matthew and Priscilla Grant, forebears of Grant, landed in the Massachusetts Bay Colony aboard the vessel Mary and John from England in 1630. Grant's great-grandfather engaged in the French and Indian conflict, while his grandfather served in the American Revolution at Bunker Hill. His sire, Jesse Root Grant, championed the Whig Party and ardently advocated for abolitionism. Grant's mater, Hannah Simpson, originated from Presbyterian immigrants from Balagalee, County Tyrone, Ireland. Jesse and Hannah wed on June 24, 1821. Their inaugural offspring, Hiram Ulysses Grant, entered the world on April 27, 1822. The appellation Ulysses was selected via a random drawing, yet Jesse, in homage to his father-in-law, christened him Hiram Ulysses, though he was universally recognized by his middle moniker, Ulysses. The brood resettled to Georgetown, Ohio, in 1823, where five additional siblings were born, Simpson, Clara, Orville, Jenny, and Mary. At the tender age of five, Ulysses embarked upon his formal scholastic journey, enrolling in a subscription school and subsequently two private academies. Throughout the winter of 1836 to 1837, he pursued education at Maysville Seminary, followed by enrollment at John Rankin's Academy in the fall of 1838. Grant cultivated an exceptional proficiency in equestrianism and equine management during his adolescence, which his progenitor leveraged by assigning him duties entailing the conveyance of wagon loads of provisions and the transportation of individuals. Despite his upbringing in a Methodist household, Grant felt no compulsion to attend church like his siblings. Across his lifespan, he maintained solitary devotions and never formally aligned with any religious denomination. To certain individuals, including his offspring, Grant appeared agnostic. Preceding the conflict, he remained largely apolitical but manifested a predilection towards Whig principles, asserting, if I had ever harbored any political inclinations, they would have aligned with the Whigs. I was nurtured in that ethos. Upon correspondence with Representative Thomas L. Harmer, Jesse Grant petitioned for the endorsement of Ulysses to the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Harmer's approval of the 17-year-old Ulysses materialized in the spring of 1839, and Grant commenced his tenure at West Point on July 1. However, owing to Harmer's unfamiliarity with Grant, an erroneous designation ensued, leading to Grant's enrollment under the appellation U.S. Grant. This resulted in Grant being colloquially referred to as Sam among his military comrades as the initials U.S. Concurrently represented Uncle Sam. Initially apathetic toward military life, Grant's sentiment gradually evolved within a year, prompting a reconsideration of his inclination to depart the academy, eventually culminating in an affirmation of his affinity for the environment. Earning renown as the preeminent equestrian and seeking respite from the rigors of military regimen, Grant pursued instruction under Romantic artist Robert Walter Weir, resulting in the creation of nine extant artworks. Additionally, Grant diverted his attention away from academic texts, devoting considerable time to perusing literary works housed within the Academy's library. Despite his reserved demeanor, Grant cultivated a select few intimate associations among his fellow cadets, notably Frederick Tracy Dent and James Longstreet. His admiration extended to both Captain Charles Ferguson Smith, the Commandant, and General Winfield Scott, whose visits to the Academy for Cadet Evaluations provided inspiration. Reflecting upon his military tenure later in life, Grant acknowledged its imperfections while expressing a predilection for its merits. Graduating on June 30, 1843, ranked 21st among 39 peers in his cohort, Grant ascended to the rank of Brevet Second Lieutenant on the subsequent day. Initially entertaining thoughts of resignation following the conclusion of his four-year tenure, Grant regarded this juncture as among the most felicitous in his life. Despite his exemplary equestrian prowess, his assignment did not align with the cavalry but instead the 4th Infantry Regiment. Grant's inaugural assignment stationed him at the Jefferson Barracks near St. Louis, Missouri, under the tutelage of Colonel Stephen W. Kearney, fostering anticipation for the culmination of his military obligations and the prospect of embarking on an educational career. In 1844, Grant accompanied Frederick Dent to Missouri, where he was introduced to Dent's familial circle, including his sister Julia, with whom he promptly forged an engagement. Their nuptials transpired on August 22, 
1848, with Julia's cousin, Longstreet, and two other alumni from West Point gracing the occasion. The union bore fruit with the arrival of four progeny, Fred Eric, Ulysses Jr., affectionately referred to as Buck, Ellen, fondly known as Nellie, and Jesse too. Distinguished for his audacity and competence during the Mexican-American War, Grant accrued combat proficiency and garnered brevet promotions in recognition of his valor. His exploits included leading charges and showcasing his equestrian acumen in engagements such as Resica de la Palma and Monterrey. Furthermore, he earned commendation for his initiative and gallantry at San Cosme. Despite his accolades, Grant harbored moral reservations regarding the conflict, perceiving the territorial acquisitions as a conduit for the proliferation of slavery. His wartime experiences, notably his tenure as an assistant quartermaster, endowed him with invaluable insights into military logistics and provisioning, augmenting his comprehension of warfare beyond mere tactical maneuvers on the battlefield. Post-war, Grant grappled with a succession of assignments, including a demanding tenure at Fort Humboldt in California, where he contended with the anguish of separation from his familial enclave and commenced a descent into intemperance. Following an incident involving alcohol consumption, Grant tendered his resignation from the military on July 31, 1854, citing his struggle with intemperance as a contributory factor in his decision-making. Upon his return to St. Louis, Grant reunited with his kin, confronted with an uncertain future but resolute in his determination to surmount personal adversities. In the year 1854, when he was 32 years old, Grant transitioned from military to civilian life, facing formidable financial struggles and a prolonged period of uncertainty lasting seven years thereafter. Deprived of a stable source of income to sustain his burgeoning family, he grappled with the challenge of meeting their needs. Grant's father proffered a position within the family's leather enterprise situated in Galena, Illinois, albeit under the stipulation that Julia and the offspring remain separated from him. Grant and Julia opted against this proposition. Instead, for the ensuing four years, Grant endeavored to cultivate the land with the aid of Julia's servant, Dan, on his relative's estate near St. Louis, identified as Wish Tun Wish. Regrettably, the agricultural pursuit proved futile, compelling Grant to augment his earnings by vending firewood on the thoroughfares of St. Louis. Subsequently, in 1856, the Grants resettled on acreage belonging to Julia's paternal progenitor, where they erected a humble abode christened Hard Scrabbles on Grant's property. Despite its unassuming facade, Julia strived to fashion a cozy sanctuary for their kin. During this period, they confronted financial hardships exacerbated by the Panic of 1857, which precipitated Grant resorting to pawning his timepiece to procure gifts for the Yuletide season. In 1858, Grant leased out Hard Scrabble and relocated his household to Julia's father's estate. However, beset by bouts of malaria, Grant resolved to relinquish agricultural pursuits altogether. Coincidentally, Grant acquired a bondsman named William Jones from his father-in-law. Despite his non-affiliation with abolitionist movements, Grant harbored antipathy towards slavery, culminating in his emancipation of William in March 1859, effectuated through a legal document of manumission. Thereafter, Grant migrated to St. Louis and collaborated with Julia's kinsman, Harry Boggs, in the domain of real estate commerce. Yet this endeavor met with limited success. Encouraged by Julia, Grant terminated the partnership. Subsequently, he sought appointment as a county engineer, only to encounter rejection owing to his political associations. In April 1860, Grant and his family relocated to Galena, where he became affiliated with his father's leather merchandise enterprise, Grant and Perkins, managed by his younger siblings. Within a brief span, Grant succeeded in discharging his debts. The family assimilated into the local milieu, partaking in the religious community by attending the Methodist congregation, and Grant established himself as an esteemed denizen of Galena. During the presidential election of 1860, Grant threw his support behind Democrat Stephen A. Douglas instead of Abraham Lincoln, torn between his anti-slavery convictions and his spouse's allegiance to the Democratic Party. The American Civil War commenced on April 12, 1861 when Confederate forces initiated an attack on Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. This news startled the residents of Galena, including Grant, who shared their apprehensions about the conflict. 
Following Lincoln's call for 75,000 volunteers on April 15, Grant participated in a mass meeting the next day to address the crisis and bolster recruitment efforts. A stirring speech by John Aaron Rawlings, his father's attorney, stirred Grant's patriotism. In a letter to his father dated April 21, Grant articulated his stance on the impending conflict, affirming the need to uphold the government, laws, and flag against traitors. Despite initially declining a captain's position at a recruitment meeting on April 18, Grant's eagerness for a more significant military role led him to seek recommission. However, initial efforts were rebuffed by Major General George B. McClellan and Brigadier General Nathaniel Leon. Grant's fortunes changed when, with the support of Congressman Elihu B. Washburn, he was appointed military aide to Governor Richard Yates and tasked with mustering 10 regiments into the Illinois militia. Subsequently, he was appointed colonel and entrusted with leading the 21st Illinois Volunteer Infantry Regiment. His leadership skills were evident as he instilled discipline and order within the regiment. With Washburn's assistance, Grant was promoted to Brigadier General of Volunteers on August 5. Major General John C. Fremont appointed him commander of the District of Southeastern Missouri, and Grant set up his headquarters in Cairo, Illinois, to plan a campaign along the Mississippi, Tennessee, and Cumberland Rivers. Grant's strategic maneuvers included securing Pajica, Kentucky, on September 6, strategically advancing despite Fremont's indecision. Following Fremont's removal from command, Grant engaged Confederate forces at Belmont on November 7, gaining valuable experience despite a chaotic Union retreat. Grant's subsequent victories at Forts Henry and Donelson marked significant achievements. Foote's gunboats captured Fort Henry on February 6, 1862, followed by the surrender of Fort Donelson on February 16, securing a major triumph for the Union. Grant's triumph at Fort Donelson, while celebrated in the North, led to tensions with Major General Henry Horleck, who accused Grant of acting without authorization. Despite the controversy, Grant's promotion to Major General of Volunteers and the moniker Unconditional Surrender Grant underscored his rising reputation. The Battle of Shiloh in April 1862, though costly, cemented Grant's reputation as a determined and capable leader. Despite initial setbacks, Grant's resilience and leadership turned the tide, ultimately forcing Confederate forces to retreat. Halleck's subsequent reassignment of command and Grant's restoration as field commander reflected the complexities of wartime leadership. Grant's subsequent victories at Euchre and Corinth, coupled with his progressive decision to integrate former slaves into the Union Army, further solidified his status as a formidable military leader and an advocate for emancipation. Grant's Vicksburg campaign was a pivotal moment in the Civil War, aimed at capturing the strategic stronghold of Vicksburg, which controlled the Mississippi River and divided the Confederacy. Despite Lincoln's initial appointment of McClernand to lead the campaign, Grant assumed overall command and devised a plan to march south to Jackson and attack Vicksburg Overland, while Sherman would attack from Chickasaw Bayou. Confederate cavalry raids disrupted Union communications and recaptured Holly Springs, hindering Grant's original strategy. Despite setbacks, Grant adapted his plans and embarked on innovative approaches, including setting up camps for contraband fugitive slaves to support the Union war effort. Grant also faced challenges with illegal cotton trade and issued controversial General Order No. 11, expelling Jews from his military district, which was later rescinded due to complaints. Grant's persistence and strategic acumen led to significant victories, including the capture of Jackson and the decisive Battle of Champion Hill. Despite initial setbacks at Vicksburg, Grant's diversionary tactics and successful crossing of the Mississippi River forced Pemberton's retreat into Vicksburg, culminating in a prolonged siege. Throughout the campaign, Grant faced personal and professional challenges, including occasional drinking bouts and ongoing rivalry with McClernand. However, his leadership and determination ultimately led to Vicksburg's surrender on July 4, 1863, a turning point that gave Union forces control of the Mississippi River and boosted morale. Following the success at Vicksburg, Grant's political sympathies aligned with radical Republicans' aggressive prosecution of the war and emancipation of slaves. His promotion to Lieutenant General and command of all Union armies marked a significant milestone enabling him to devise a comprehensive strategy to defeat the Confederacy. 
grant subsequent actions, including the Chattanova campaign and the Overland campaign, further solidified his reputation as a formidable military leader. Despite facing heavy casualties and challenges, Grant's determination and strategic brilliance played a crucial role in ultimately securing victory for the Union. The Battle of Cold Harbor was a critical engagement during the American Civil War, taking place in June 1864 as part of General Ulysses S. Grant's Overland campaign against Confederate General Robert E. A. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Grant aimed to break through Lee's defenses at Cold Harbor, a strategic road hub linking to Richmond, with the belief that victory there would lead to the destruction of Lee's army, the capture of Richmond, and a swift end to the rebellion. Grant's forces, numbering over 100,000 men, faced Lee's army of approximately 59,000 soldiers. Despite waiting for reinforcements and multiple delays in launching the attack, Grant decided to proceed on the morning of June 3, 1864. However, the Confederate army had hastily constructed formidable entrenchments, rendering the Union assault extremely costly. The Union suffered between 12,000 to 14,000 casualties, while Confederate losses were significantly lower. The high number of casualties shocked the North and intensified anti-war sentiment. After the battle, Grant attempted to negotiate a truce to gather wounded soldiers, but Lee insisted on a total ceasefire resulting in many casualties dying on the battlefield. Grant later expressed regret for the disastrous assault at Cold Harbor, acknowledging that it was a mistake. Following the Battle of Cold Harbor, Grant continued his campaign against Lee's forces, eventually laying siege to Petersburg, Virginia. The siege lasted for nine months, during which Grant employed various tactics to weaken Lee's army. Lee's eventual surrender at Appomattox Court House on April 9, 1865, marked the effective end of the Civil War, with subsequent Confederate surrender solidifying Union victory. Grant's role in the Civil War, including his leadership during battles like Cold Harbor and his eventual acceptance of Lee's surrender, contributed significantly to the Union's success and the preservation of the United States. After the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant continued his military career as commander of the Army, overseeing various responsibilities such as dealing with Emperor Maximilian and French troops in Mexico, enforcing reconstruction policies in the former Confederate states, and supervising Indian wars on the Western Plains. He played a crucial role in advocating for lenient treatment of Confederate generals, including Robert E. Lee, and resisting President Andrew Johnson's attempts to indict them for treason. Grant's tour of the South in 1865 aimed to gather information about the state of affairs and counter unfavorable reports regarding the treatment of Southern whites and blacks. He recommended the continuation of the Freedmen's Bureau but opposed the use of black troops, believing it discouraged farm labor. Grant's views on Reconstruction policies initially aligned with Johnson's conservative approach, but their relationship soured as Grant began to support more radical measures. The rift between Grant and Johnson widened over time, particularly regarding the enforcement of civil rights legislation and Johnson's attempts to undermine Reconstruction efforts. Grant's popularity soared among radical Republicans, leading to his appointment as ad interim Secretary of War after Johnson's dismissal of Edwin Stanton. Despite initial reservations, Grant accepted the position to prevent a conservative appointee from hindering Reconstruction. Grant's resignation from the position of Secretary of War further strained his relationship with Johnson, culminating in a complete break between the two. Johnson's subsequent impeachment and trial in the Senate further solidified Grant's standing among Republicans, paving the way for his presidential nomination in 1868. During the election campaign, Grant emphasized national unity and peace, adopting the slogan, Let Us of Peace. His advocacy for civil and political rights for all citizens, including African Americans, contrasted with the Democratic Party's platform, which opposed suffrage for African Americans and sought to end Reconstruction. Grant's victory in the election, with significant support from African American voters, marked a significant milestone in American history, making him the youngest president elected at the time and the first after the abolition of slavery. During Ulysses S. Grant's presidency from 1869 to 1877, he pursued various domestic and foreign policies, making significant contributions to civil rights, reconstruction, and national governance. Domestic policies, Grant prioritized civil rights and advocated for equal rights for African Americans. 
He signed laws granting black people the right to serve on juries, hold office, and obtain citizenship through the Naturalization Act. Grant's cabinet appointments were a mix of successes and controversies. Notably, he appointed Hamilton Fish as Secretary of State and George S. Boutwell as Secretary of the Treasury. However, some appointments face legal challenges, such as Alexander T. Stewart's nomination as Secretary of Treasury. Grant supported women's rights, including female suffrage, and appointed more than 50 Jewish individuals to federal offices in response to reports of persecution of Jewish people abroad. He proposed a constitutional amendment to limit religious indoctrination in public schools, advocating for schools to be inclusive and secular. Reconstruction Policies Grant implemented and enforced reconstruction policies aimed at protecting the rights of African Americans in the South. He signed legislation creating the Justice Department to prosecute the Ku Klux Klan, and passed enforcement acts to safeguard black people and reconstruction governments. Grant's Attorney General, Amos T. Wackerman, played a key role in prosecuting Klan members, leading to the collapse of the Klan's power by 1872. Despite initial successes, Reconstruction faced challenges due to Northern apathy, economic depression, and Grant's own scandals. Southern conservatives formed armed groups to overturn Republican rule, leading to increased violence and intimidation against black Southerners. Foreign policy, Grant advocated for the ratification of the 15th Amendment and encouraged Native American, civilization and ultimate citizenship in his inaugural address. He addressed international issues, such as supporting Jewish people abroad and opposing polygamy in Utah Territory. Grant's administration prosecuted Mormon polygamists and signed the Poland Act to limit their influence. Legacy, Grant's presidency was marked by significant efforts to protect civil rights and advance Reconstruction. Despite challenges and setbacks, he played a pivotal role in shaping post-Civil War America. His administration's actions laid the foundation for future civil rights movements and legal reforms, although some initiatives faced criticism or legal obstacles. Overall, Ulysses S. Grant's presidency was characterized by a commitment to civil rights, reconstruction, and national unity, despite facing formidable challenges and controversies. During his presidency, Ulysses S. Grant implemented various financial and foreign policies that left a lasting impact on the nation's economy and international relations. Financial affairs, Grant inherited a nation with a currency system heavily affected by the Civil War. To stabilize the economy, he signed the Public Credit Act of 1869, which aimed to return the country to the gold standard within 10 years. This act guaranteed bondholders repayment in coin or its equivalent, gradually replacing greenback notes with species-backed currency. Grant's efforts to stabilize the economy faced challenges, including the Gold Corner Conspiracy of 1869. Railroad tycoons Jay Gould and Jim Fisk conspired to corner the gold market, leading to a panic on Wall Street known as Black Friday. Grant's administration intervened to stabilize the market, but the incident highlighted the need for financial reforms. Despite facing economic turmoil, Grant's policies ultimately contributed to the post-war recovery of the economy, demonstrating his commitment to fiscal responsibility and stability. Foreign Affairs Grant's foreign policy was marked by a combination of expansionist ambitions, idealistic principles, and diplomatic challenges. One of his notable achievements was the settlement of the Alabama claims through the Treaty of Washington in 1871. This treaty resolved disputes with Britain over damages caused to Union merchant ships during the Civil War, securing reparations and strengthening diplomatic relations between the two nations. Grant's administration also embarked on diplomatic missions, such as the United States expedition to Korea in 1871. This expedition aimed to open trade with Korea and investigate the fate of a missing American ship. While the expedition achieved military success, it failed to achieve its diplomatic objectives and did not open up trade with Korea. Grant's attempt to annex the Dominican Republic, known as Santo Domingo, faced opposition in Congress, particularly from Senator Charles Sumner. Despite Grant's efforts to secure annexation, the Senate rejected the treaties, highlighting the challenges of foreign policy implementation in a democratic system. Overall, Ulysses S. Grant's presidency witnessed significant developments in financial policy and foreign relations.
reflecting his efforts to address the economic aftermath of the Civil War and assert American interests on the global stage. During Ulysses S. Grant's presidency, American policy toward Cuba and Native American tribes underwent significant developments, with Grant navigating delicate diplomatic situations and grappling with the complexities of federal Indian policy. Cuba and the Virginius Affair, Grant's administration adopted a policy of neutrality during the Ten Years' War in Cuba, aiming to protect American commerce and maintain peace with Spain. Despite calls to recognize the belligerence of Cuban rebels, Grant endorsed Spanish colonial rule while advocating for the abolition of slavery in Cuba. The Virginius Affair in October 1873 tested this policy when a Spanish cruiser captured the American merchant ship Virginius, mistaking it for a vessel aiding Cuban insurgents. Spanish authorities executed American citizens aboard the ship, leading to public outrage in the United States. Grant responded by dispatching U.S. Navy warships to Cuba and negotiating a diplomatic resolution with Spain. The surviving captives were released, and Spain paid indemnities to the families of the executed Americans, de-escalating tensions between the two nations. Free trade with Hawaii, despite opposition from Democrats, Grant and his Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish, secured a free trade treaty with the Kingdom of Hawaii in 1875. This treaty allowed for the incorporation of Hawaii's sugar industry into the U.S. economic sphere. King Kalkawa of Hawaii made a historic state visit to the United States, further cementing the diplomatic relationship between the two nations. The treaty faced criticism from Southern Democrats who viewed it as an attempt to annex Hawaii and disparage the Hawaiian people. However, Congress ultimately passed the Implementation Bill leading to increased investment in Hawaii's sugar plantations by American interests. Federal Indian policy, Grant's administration inherited a chaotic Native American policy, marked by conflicts and broken treaties. Grant pursued a policy of assimilation, advocating for Native Americans to adopt European customs, education, and Christianity. Grant appointed Ely S. Parker, a Seneca Native American, as Commissioner of Indian Affairs signaling a new approach to Native American policy. Despite efforts to implement a peace policy, setbacks occurred, including the Maria's Massacre and the Modoc War. Grant's policy was undermined by internal conflicts, economic interests, and continued violence against Native American tribes. The Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, where George Armstrong Custer and his men were massacred by Sioux warriors, highlighted the ongoing tensions between Native Americans and the U.S. government. Grant's peace policy survived his presidency but faced criticism for its disregard of tribal cultures and the continued conflicts with Native American tribes. Overall, Ulysses S. Grant's presidency was marked by complex diplomatic challenges and attempts to address long-standing issues in American foreign and domestic policy, including relations with Cuba, Hawaii, and Native American tribes. The election of 1872 and Grant's second term as president saw a continuation of the political and economic challenges that marked his first term, including opposition from within his own party and economic turmoil. Election of 1872, the Liberal Republicans, dissatisfied with Grant's administration, nominated Horace Greeley for president, while the Democrats adopted the Greeley-Brown ticket and platform. Grant, supported by the Republicans, ran on a platform that included extended amnesty, lowered tariffs, and civil service reform. Grant won re-election easily, securing 56% of the popular vote and an electoral college landslide of 286 to 66. Despite opposition from some former slave states, Grant's victory was seen as a vindication of his presidency. Grant's second term, in his second inaugural address, Grant reiterated his commitment to freedom and fairness for all Americans, with a focus on citizenship for freed slaves and restoring good feelings between different sections of the nation. Grant faced economic challenges during his second term, including the Panic of 1873, which led to the collapse of Jay Cook and Company and widespread financial turmoil. Grant responded to the economic crisis by consulting with leading businessmen and bankers and injecting cash into the system through government bond purchases. However, the nation still experienced an industrial depression known as the Long Depression. Grant vetoed the Inflation Bill in 1874, which aimed to stimulate the economy through increased circulation of greenbacks. 
Despite pressure from some Republicans, Grant believed the bill would harm the nation's credit and vetoed it. Grant later signed the Specie Payment Resumption Act in 1875, which gradually reduced the number of greenbacks in circulation and declared they would be redeemed for gold beginning in 1879. Overall, Grant's second term was marked by both political and economic challenges, with the president facing opposition from within his own party and grappling with the effects of a major financial crisis. During Grant's presidency, significant reforms were implemented alongside several scandals that tainted his administration. Reforms Grant appointed Secretary of Interior Jacob D. Or Cox, who initiated civil service reform by firing unqualified clerks and establishing the first Civil Service Commission. The Civil Service Commission created rules for competitive exams, ended mandatory political assessments, and implemented a merit-based appointment system for federal positions. Grant's administration made efforts to clean up corruption in the New York Customs House, with reforms led by Chester A. Arthur. Grant signed legislation increasing pay for federal employees, Congress, the judiciary, and the president, though some aspects of the law were later repealed. Private moiety contracts for tax collection were ended, and a crackdown on tax evasion schemes led to the discovery of the Whiskey Ring, a collusion between distillers and treasury officials. Scandals Despite Grant's efforts at reform, his administration was plagued by numerous scandals, including the involvement of officials in corrupt practices. The New York Customs House scandal involved lucrative fees for warehouse space and led to the firing of corrupt officials. The safe burglary conspiracy and the involvement of officials in extortion scandals further tarnished Grant's administration. Secretary of War William W. Belknap's resignation and impeachment for accepting kickbacks highlighted corruption within Grant's cabinet. Grant's brother, Orville, was implicated in kickback schemes and Secretary of Navy Robeson was accused of accepting bribes from a naval contractor. Grant's own reputation suffered as scandals continued to unfold during his presidency, leading to apologies to the nation for errors of judgment. Election of 1876, Grant's decision not to seek a third term paved the way for the election of Governor Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio, who won a contested election against Governor Samuel J. Tilden of New York. The election crisis was resolved through the Compromise of 1877, which marked the end of Reconstruction and the withdrawal of federal troops from southern capitals. Post-presidency, after leaving office, Grant toured various cities and enjoyed a brief respite from politics, staying with friends and family. Grant's post-presidential years were marked by financial difficulties, leading him to embark on a world tour to raise funds through lectures and writing. Despite the scandals of his presidency, Grant remained a respected figure, and his calm demeanor during the election crisis of 1876 helped to appease the nation. Grant's world tour was a significant undertaking that lasted around two and a half years, spanning Europe, Africa, India, the Middle East, and the Far East. Funded by investments from a Nevada-based mining company, the tour provided Grant and his wife with the opportunity to meet with notable dignitaries such as Queen Victoria. Tsar Alexander II, Pope Leo XIII, Otto von Bismarck, Li Hongzhong, and Emperor Meiji. During the tour, the Hayes administration encouraged Grant to unofficially represent the United States and strengthen American interests abroad. Grant's diplomatic role involved resolving issues for some countries, while showcasing the emerging power of the United States to Europe and Asia. The tour demonstrated America's growing influence on the world stage. Grant's popularity led to attempts to nominate him for a third presidential term in 1880, led by his political ally Roscoe Conkling and the stalwart faction of the Republican Party. However, after numerous ballots at the Republican National Convention, James A. Garfield emerged as the compromise candidate and ultimately won the election. Grant's later years were marked by financial difficulties including failed business ventures such as the Mexican Southern Railroad and the collapse of the brokerage firm Grant & Ward, which led to the Panic of 1884. Despite these setbacks, Grant embarked on writing his memoirs to provide for his family. Completed just days before his death, the personal memoirs of U.S. Grant became a critical and commercial success, earning significant royalties for his widow. Grant's death in 1885 was met with widespread mourning and tributes across the country. 
His funeral procession in New York City drew over a million attendees, including dignitaries, military personnel, and civilians. Grant was laid to rest in Riverside Park and later interred in the General Grant National Memorial, known as Grant's Tomb, where he remains the largest mausoleum in North America. Grant's historical reputation has undergone significant shifts over time, reflecting changing perspectives and interpretations by historians and the public alike. Initially hailed as the winning general of the American Civil War, Grant's military reputation remained largely intact, although his presidency was marred by scandals and viewed unfavorably by some. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Grant's reputation suffered due to the influence of the Lost Cause, Movement and the Dunning School, which portrayed him as an unsuccessful president and unskilled general. However, a reassessment of Grant's military career began in the 1950s, with historians recognizing his strategic prowess and modern leadership style. In more recent years, Grant's historical reputation has experienced a resurgence, thanks in part to acclaimed biographies such as William S. McFeelis Pulitzer Prize-winning work and Jean Edward Smith's comprehensive study, these works portrayed Grant as an ordinary American striving to make his mark, highlighting his personal integrity, reconstruction efforts, and commitment to civil rights. Subsequent biographies by H. W. Brands, Ronald C. O. White, and Ron Scher now have further elevated Grant's legacy, emphasizing his humility, moral courage, and determination as both a military leader and president. Despite ongoing debates about his effectiveness in halting corruption during his presidency, Grant's military strategies continue to be studied and admired, with some aspects adapted into successful business practices. Memorial sites and monuments across the United States honor Grant's legacy, including Grant's tomb in New York City and the Ulysses S. Grant Memorial in Washington, D.C. His image also appears on currency, postage stamps, and other commemorative items, reflecting his enduring significance in American history. While Grant's historical reputation has faced challenges and criticisms over time, his contributions to the Union's victory in the Civil War, his efforts toward Reconstruction, and his commitment to civil rights have cemented his place as a significant figure in American history.